Welcome to another video. In this video, we're going to be looking at the weekly S&P 500 chart storm. This is what I do on Twitter weekly. It looks at 10 different charts on the market. And really, most of the time, it's just whatever I find interesting. But sometimes, you know, probably this week is in a bit of an example. It's, uh, you know, it's more driven by what's sort of going on or, um, you know, try to be a bit more sort of timely as well and on that note let's look at the first one so this is from a website called indexindicators.com i suggest you bookmark that site immediately because it's got some very useful charting tools on there and this one here is showing on the green line the percentage of s p 500 stocks above the 200 day moving average or 200 day moving average breadth now the purpose of breadth indicators is really to see what what where the um sort of the lay of the market really. So for example here we've got what we typically call bearish breadth divergence. So you can see the market's going up and up and up, um, making new highs, lower highs on breadth and it's sort of diverging to the downside. So you know, for example at the at the top there. Uh, you know, you can see there a little under 70% were actually above the 200 day moving average. And, you know, um, why 200 day moving average? Uh, it's generally, you know, a very loose um, and pretty dumb kind of rule of thumb about whether a stock's in an uptrend or a downtrend. If it's above its 200 day, it's generally thought of as being in an uptrend, vice versa. So you can sort of, it, that might make it pretty clear pretty quickly about how this can be quite useful. And, um, you know, the other aspect of breadth, you know, apart from divergences, uh, this is the, the absolute level of it. So when it moves to very high extreme levels, typically that can actually be a bit of a, um, a, a tactical top sign. So, you know, you could have kind of saw that then. And when it moves very sharply, very low, that's typically what it, will, it, do, it does that during a sell-off or a correction. Um, you know, and those that, those two comments work in a uptrending market, um, work less well in a market that is undergoing a trend change. So when, when a market go, undergoes a trend change, you'll see breadth collapse, and it'll pretty much stay collapse as um, the market continues to go down. So, you know, that's um, sort of the caveat on that one. It's just like all indicators, um, they work some of the time, but not all of the time. Number two, another brief chart actually, and this one is 52 week highs minus lows. And again, it sort of um, can be useful. You're, you're looking for, again, divergences. You're also looking for extremes. So we did actually see a little slight divergence there, lower, lower highs versus higher highs. And what I did note there too is that the move has been, you know, actually worse than it got to during the election for the shock there. And that's on only a 3%, well not even a 3%, I think it was about minus 2.8% um, fall from top to bottom. So you can see that, um, you know, if, when things get moving, they can get moving pretty dramatically. This one, most popular chart in the session, is looking at year-to-date performance versus the historical average. Um, a lot of people, when they see this chart, they try to call it out and say, you know, hang on, you've got two axes, you're trying to mislead, and that's wrong, it's not what they're doing at all. All I'm showing here is so ignore the red line for the moment and look at the black line. I'm saying this is what it looks like, you know, average day-to-day -day move across the uh, the period 1990 to 2016. That's what it generally looked like, and generally um, you find that it's weaker in this patch here and stronger outside of that patch. And and there's a lot of academic research that have looked across markets and found that this phenomenon is actually pretty ubiquitous. Um, there's a couple of theories for why that may be the case. Uh, one is the summer holiday period. You know, Northern Hemisphere has their summer holiday around here. Um, 
and it still applies to markets in the southern hemisphere and i guess the, the, the reason why that is is because you know you think about the northern hemisphere markets they're still the dominant liquidity providers still the um still make up the, the global beta and you know back to why i've put the red line there is just really showing it in context um, <clears throat> so if you have them on one axis the red line is sort of up here if you can see where the cursor is um, doesn't really make a difference. Um, the, the key point there is this, the black line. What's going on there? Um, and you know, if it if it moves precisely in line with history, it'll dip down a bit and then go up towards the end of the year. Of course, there's a lot of other things going on. But you know, when you think about seasonality, it's one factor. And if it's if it's adding up, you know, on top of a bunch of other things, then that can be, you know, adding to that signal pretty meaningfully. Next one is really it's just the same thing for the VIX. Um, it's not really much more to say about that, is it? Other than that, I tend to see the VIX trend up at this time of the year, and that kind of makes sense because the VIX usually moves up when the market's going down, and this is a seasonally weak part of the year. So enough said on that. Another volatility-related chart here. Pausing for a drink there. Uh, this one shows the rolling 12-month count of daily percent changes that have exceeded plus or minus 1%. So this is rises and falls that have gone up, up or down by more than a 1% point. <clears throat> That's moved from a low of I think it was 13 to 16, so not a huge move, but you can see there just a slight tick up. reason why it's worth pointing out the, the, the tick up there is that you know, you, the regime changes or, you know, when this starts to become useful as a signal is when it starts to tick up from extreme low levels. <coughs> like all indicators, you want to be looking out for those extremes. And particularly, you want to be looking for an extreme where it turns. Now, it did work as a bit of a warning indicator a couple of times when it's done this. Um, the exception there would be the late 90s, which, you know, really was an exceptional period. By many counts, um, it showed it actually moving from, I guess, sort of a, a steady bull market to a more erratic and um, arguably a bit more euphoric bull market because, you know, you'd expect to see a lot more. I mean, bigger percentage changes probably reflect more emotion in the market as well. So I'll move on to the next one, which is actually just another view on that. and. What this does is uh, lowers the bar in the case of the 0.5% or greater moves and raises the bar for the 2 and 5% moves. So you can see 5% move, we haven't had um, <laughs> one of those for quite some time. Um, generally, I only tend to get those in very exceptional circumstances. We saw a lot of them during the financial crisis. Um, those were some interesting days then, I can tell you that. And of course, back there during the 87 period, there was a few there as well. The 2% moves, um, yeah, they're relatively rare as well, and um, you know, haven't had a new one of those in quite some time as well. And again, why would you look at this chart? Why does it matter? Um, it's it's also looking for extremes. I mean, you know, <laughs> any 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 indicator where you start to see extremes, you start to pay attention and you know, when it's hitting the lower end like this, and when you've had that slight tick up on the 1% one, it tends to sort of alert you to at least the possibility of a, of a change in regime. And, you know, I think we've gotten, <coughs> we've gotten off, um, we've had a fairly, fairly nice run, really. Um, you know, there's been a lot, just about everything that can go, well, there's been a lot going right for the markets, and, um, I guess um, prices have been able to run up despite high valuations um, and you know those high valuations one interpretation of that is that the expectations are high and you know these expectations are subject to disappointment from time to time and of course the other thing too is that you know 
One thing that's contributing probably to this slump in volatility is um, central bank or monetary policy support and as we see monetary policy support start to come away or turn, certainly that's pretty much the global trend that we've started to recognise there is that <coughs> we'll probably start to see a bit more volatility um, come, coming just simply as a result of a sort of volatility suppressing force um, slowly being removed. And then the final, it's the final one on volatility here, that's just a, um, a sort of timing indicator. It's the VXV, which is a medium term VIX, to the, to the VIX itself, um, which is kind of like the spot measure. And really what that is, is the pretty much a representation of the shape of the futures curve. Um, if you see the VXV being higher than the spot, then you know that what's implicit in that is that traders expect the future value of the VIX to be higher than the present. Um, and there's a number of reasons that they might expect that. Um, and this one, so what I've shown it here is normally people use the VIX to VXV, but I'm showing it here as the VIX, VXV to VIX because it sort of puts it in a kind of consistent fashion with the S&P 500 itself. Um, so you can see there when it, when it goes, when it spikes to the downside, which is typically as a result of the VIX itself spiking and spiking above the longer term one. That's often a signal of uh, oversold conditions. And, you know, we've had that signal here. So that raises the odds of a short term bounce. Um, but, you know, it's, it's like a lot of those kind of indicators, kind of like the one that I mentioned earlier with the breadth indicator, is that it will fall, this indicator will fall and stay low or, you know, um, during a, a period where there's a bit of more of a extended correction or a, a, a transition from uptrend to downtrend. So it's just one thing to keep in mind that it's, uh, you know, the risk of a bounce is high, but, you know, it's not a, not an infallible indicator. The number eight is a chart from a website called Trade Followers. <clears throat> These guys track bearish and bullish sentiment on stocks on Twitter based on tweets and the content of the tweets. And you can see here the red line, so that's number of bearish stocks. Basically the blue line up here is the breadth of bearish and bullish stocks. And the one that the reason why this one caught my eye is that that red line has started to move upwards. And yeah, it it's kind of works as a little bit of a contrarian indicator, I suppose. But you know, it's 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 another piece of information to have on board that that is um, starting to tick up, and it's one to monitor if you want to check that out yourself. The link is there on the tweet. Otherwise, it's tradefollowers.com, and it's the bread indicator that they've got. Fear and Greed. This one is that CNN Money Fear and Greed Index. Google Fear and Greed and you'll find it. Um, and really the point there is that, you know, again, even though the S&P 500 itself hasn't moved that much, we've seen a very rapid and sharp move towards extreme fear. And I think that that um, is kind of a key point for the current market environment really is that, you know, uh, it's not taking that much to unnerve investors uh, and you know I think that that's probably quite to be expected really if um, you think about the probably the two biggest um, potential risk factors is higher valuations especially for the US market high valuations and um, tightening monetary policy or at least, at least, uh, less less support from monetary policy. So, as those two trends extend, you know, sooner or later the thing will break, because you know if valuations continue to go up and monetary policy support continues to get removed, continues to tighten, 
there's only so so long that they can carry on for and um you know i think everyone should be well aware of that and i guess in the moment that you know you start to see cracks in the foundation or any um any sort of warning signs or any even just bad news you tend to get a bit more skittish and you know i think that it's that you know kind of as i mentioned before the market's had a fairly um, easy run in terms of bad news, in terms of actual movements, you know, actual events. There's a lot of risk, but there's no, there hasn't been much in the way of actual events. Like North Korea, for example, they've um, they've said a lot, done a little bit, but they haven't really done anything that's um, going to have any big lasting impact on the markets. So, you know, I think that's uh, it's quite normal, but it is. Um, an important feature to note of the market because as um it just means that you know it's increasingly vulnerable to to bad news to events and um you know that's why i started to you know i think there's probably defensive positioning um was probably good it started to point that out to clients in the um reports that i'm doing over on top down charts and um yeah, so that's one to note. Uh, last one, just quickly look at this and wrap it up. Uh, this is the sentiment poll they've been doing on Twitter. And that red line is the bull bear spread. And it's moved down as you kind of would expect with, with the market. Um, I'll just pull up just as an article on this. So you can see here the orange line is fundamentals and technical sentiment so in that survey we actually differentiate between fundamental and technical sentiment technicals is where the big move has been going on um, and you know, I think there's probably you can probably find actually quite a few, few of the te technical sin signals have actually moved fairly sharply <coughs> and that, that one along with the VIX there um, the inside the VIX and the sentiment signals um, both moved in that suggests that there's an element of fear starting to come into the market certainly um, reflects that notion that the market is becoming increasingly sensitive to risks or bad news and then that last one there just equities versus bond sentiment and the bond sentiment's inverted so you know, very much you can see that the general move there has been consistent across bonds and equities. And I will leave it at that. Um, if you want to check out the this tweet storm or this chart storm, I'll put the link into the YouTube video. And and uh, yeah, uh, if you're interested in markets and charts and all the rest of it, then do subscribe to the channel because we'll be doing a another video later in the week about the weekly macro themes we'll be looking at um not sure what we'll be looking at yet but stay tuned and uh we'll get that up soon